Hello and happy Black History Month. I'm sure we'll all agree that this year 2020 has been an interesting one. No matter our race, we all have a common enemy in this virus we're trying to beat. But for the black race, this year has led to an uprising for many, a deeper understanding of our struggles and of our pride. The culture in our black communities is so diverse, so rich and so beautiful. But we have many avenues and opportunities to celebrate our culture. In food, in music, in dance, so many ways. But history, I believe, not culture, but history, gets left out. Perhaps it's because of the sheer passage of time, or our history has been suppressed. Our storytellers have been quietened. Our historians have been gagged. Or maybe it's because a lot of our history is dark and unpalatable and sometimes quite inconceivable. It's Black History Month. Let this month do what it says on the team. It's about looking back to where we came from so we can get a sweeter appreciation of where we are and a better glimpse of where we're headed. It's about sharing black stories. The Royal College of General Practitioners is one of the most diverse of all the Royal Colleges, with a sizable proportion of its members being black and proud. The RCGP takes diversity, inclusion and equality very seriously and here we walk the talk. This year, the RCGP is celebrating Black History Month in a big way, with a lineup of activities, all with the aim of sharing Black stories. There has been immense contributions to the field of medicine from the Black race, and in this video, I will share some of the stories. This list is in no way exhaustive, but it gives a peek into the many ways the black race advances mankind. Dr. Vivian Thomas was an American laboratory technician in the 1940s who developed a cardiac surgery technique which has saved countless lives till date. This is the Blaylock Thomas Tossig shunt. He graduated with honours from high school and hoped to become a doctor, but the Great Depression derailed his plans, and so he got a job as a surgical research assistant to Dr. Alfred Blaylock. He was classified and paid as a janitor, despite the fact he was doing the work of a postdoctoral researcher in Blaylock's lab. This is because, at the time, the role janitor was the only one available to people of colour. In the summer of 1943, Blaylock was approached by pediatric cardiologist Helen Tossig, who was seeking a surgical solution to a complex heart anomaly called Tetralogy of Fallot, otherwise known as Blue Baby Syndrome. Thomas was charged with the task of first creating a blue baby-like syndrome in a dog and then correcting it. And when Dr. Blaylock saw the sheer perfection of what Thomas had done, that was when he made the famous exclamation, this looks like something the Lord made. However, although the procedure had been designed and perfected by Thomas, he could not perform the surgery on a human patient because he was not a doctor. And so he taught Blaylock the procedure. The first surgery was performed in November 1944 on an 18-month-old girl at the John Hopkins Hospital. And at Blaylock's request, Thomas stood on a step stool at Blaylock's shoulder and coached him step by step through the procedure. Several medical journals cited the case, giving credit to Blaylock and Torsig for the procedure. Thomas received no mention. Despite the deep respect Thomas had gained in the surgical sphere, he was not well paid. He sometimes resorted to working odd jobs to make ends meet, including working as a bartender often at Blaylock's parties. This led to the peculiar and awkward circumstance of him serving drinks to people he had been teaching earlier in the day. 
Thomas's technique has saved countless lives and the BT shunt is still used till this day. After many years on the insistence of the cohort of surgeons he had trained, the John Hopkins University appointed him an instructor of cardiac surgery and he was awarded an honorary doctorate degree without any education beyond high school. Dr. Vivian Thomas rose above poverty and racism to become a cardiac surgery pioneer and we honor his legacy today. Mary Seacole has often been cited as an example of heeding black history. She was born in Jamaica more than 200 years ago, the daughter of a Jamaican healer and doctress. Her mother had mastered folk and Afro-Caribbean remedies, which Seacole would later use to save the lives of British soldiers on the battlefield. In 1854, Mary Seacole travelled to England and approached the war office asking to be sent as an army nurse to the Crimea where there was known to be poor medical facilities for wounded soldiers. She was refused. Undaunted, Siko funded her own trip into the Crimea where she set up the British Hotel behind the lines during the Crimean War. She provided treatment to wounded servicemen on the battlefield and finally became known as Mother Siko. In 2004, she was voted into first place in an online poll of 100 great black Britons. In 2005, British politician at the time, Boris Johnson, learnt about Sickle from his daughter's school pageant and wrote, I find myself facing the grim possibility that it was my own education that was blinkered. In 2007, Sickle was introduced into the national curriculum of Britain and her life story is taught at many primary schools in the UK alongside that of Florence Nightingale. In 2016, a statue of the Crimean War heroine was unveiled at the entrance of St Thomas's Hospital in London, and the words on it were written by Times correspondent William Howard Russell in 1857, and it reads, I trust that England will not forget the one who nursed her sick, who sought out her wounded to aid and succour them, and who performed the last offices for some of her illustrious dead. We celebrate and honour Mary Seacole, who got herself out to the war by her own efforts, risked her life to bring comfort to the wounded and dying soldiers. Whenever you think of blood transfusion and how many lives it has saved, think of Dr. Charles Drew. Charles Drew was an African-American physician who developed the process with which we now store blood in blood banks. Before his work, it was believed that blood could not be stored and blood transfusions were live transfusions with the donor and recipient attached to each other. This was of course impractical and so it was a welcome relief when Drew developed a mechanism to store blood around the time of World War II. He directed the blood plasma programs of the United States and Great Britain in the Second World War and in 1941, Drew was appointed medical director of the Red Cross Blood Bank. He later resigned after a ruling that the blood of African Americans would be segregated, making Drew himself ineligible to participate in the very program he established. We celebrate this hero for his immense contribution to medicine, but most of all, we celebrate him for standing against discrimination and segregation. Dr. Harold Moody worked tirelessly to campaign for better treatment for black Brits in the early 20th century and has often been called Britain's Martin Luther King. He was born in Jamaica and traveled to Britain in 1904 to study medicine, finishing top of his class at King's College London. Having been refused work because of his color, he started his own medical practice in Peckham in 1913. Following the alien's order of 1920, employment opportunities for black people were greatly limited, and in 1931, Moody formed the League of Colored Peoples, which was concerned with racial equality and civil rights in Britain and other parts of the world. He was a respected and influential doctor in Peckham, and was very involved in organizing the local community during the Second World War. 
Historian Stephen Bourne said, in 1944, there was a terrible bombing in South London and Harold Moody was the first doctor on the scene. He played an important role in these events, saving many lives, yet this wartime history is not known. Moody is named on the list of 100 great black Britons. A bronze bust of Harold Moody sits proudly in the National Portrait Gallery, London. And on 1st September 2020, a Google Doodle celebrating his life was shown. Samuel Achilefu is a Nigerian-born scientist and medical researcher who's best known for inventing the cancer goggles. These are glasses that make cancer cells glow. With these glasses and the dye injected into a patient's tumor, the cancerous cells glow when viewed with its glasses and infrared light, making it easier for surgeons to find and remove these cells. In surgical procedures to remove cancer cells, differentiating between healthy cells and cancerous cells is difficult, and before Achilefu's invention, an excess amount of healthy tissue would have to be sacrificed in these operations. And even when erring on the side of caution, up to 25% of patients might need a repeat procedure to remove more cancerous cells. Achilefu says the primary goal of his technology is to make sure that the surgeon does not operate in the blind, is to make the cancer cells light up like a Christmas tree. His goal is to leave no cancer behind. Achilefu is actively seeking solutions to many health challenges and he currently has 59 issued US patents and over 300 scientific papers. We celebrate Dr. Samuel Achilefu. Onesimus was an African slave sold to Cotton Mather, an influential minister in Boston. At the time, smallpox was the most deadly disease in the colony, and when Martha asked Onesimus if he had ever had smallpox, he answered both yes and no. Onesimus described a process practiced in his native land that involved rubbing the pus from the infected person into an open wound on the arm of a non-infected person. Onesimus stated that whoever had the courage to go through the process was forever free of the disease. This process, known as variolation at the time, was long practiced among sub-Saharan Africans. Martha was fascinated and he verified Onesimus' story by speaking with other enslaved Africans that described going through the same process in their native lands. Martha then wrote a letter to the Royal Society of London in hopes of promoting the procedure, but it was immediately rejected. Five years later, this is in 1796, Edward Jenner used Onesimus's concept written by Mather in the Journal of the Royal Society of London to develop a vaccine for smallpox, which was widely used for the next 200 years. In 1980, the World Health Organization declared smallpox completely eradicated, and it remains the only infectious disease affecting humans to have attained eradication. We celebrate Onesimus and his contribution to advancing mankind. Patricia Bath was an ophthalmologist who took a special interest in combating preventable blindness in undeserved populations. She invented the laser phaco probe, a device which uses laser to dissolve cataracts, and this has revolutionized the treatment of cataracts. Until her death in 2019, she continued to improve the laser phaco device, which has successfully restored vision to people who had been unable to see for decades. We celebrate this heroine, Patricia Barth. Henrietta Lacks was a 31-year-old woman whose immortal cells continue to advance medicine. She died of cervical cancer in 1951, and while her disease was a tragedy for her family, for the world of medical research, and in fact for every one of us on this planet, it was something of a miracle, one which benefits us all. 
because in the years since her death, cells taken from her tumor while she was undergoing surgery have been used in some of the most important medical advances of all time. The polio vaccine, chemotherapy, cloning, gene mapping, IVF, the development of HIV drugs, all these health milestones and many more owe everything to the life and death of this young woman. Her cells, known as HeLa cells, were noticed to have a unique ability to multiply infinitely and became the first immortal human cell line in history. In 1955, HeLa cells became the first human cells to be successfully cloned. But Henrietta Lacks, who was poor, black and uneducated, never consented to her cells being used in medical research. In 1954, Jonas Salk used the HeLa strain to develop the polio vaccine, sparking mass interest in the cells and leading to a high demand in the scientific community and the cells were then put into mass production. There are clearly several ethical concerns around HeLa cells which further drive home the point of black injustice. Many years after her death, the immortal cells of Henrietta Lacks continue to advance science and the human race by making it possible for us to understand cancer growth and the multiplication of cells.